Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Michelle Ephraim, Professor of English in the Department of Humanities and Arts at WPI. My colleague, Professor Kate McIntyre and I are thrilled to be co-hosting this Arts and Sciences Week event in support of WPI's Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies program, as well as our creative writing program. Many thanks to Dean Jean King and to the Arts and Sciences administrative staff for all of your help and support in bringing Meg Megan Giddings virtually to WPI. Megan, it is my great pleasure to introduce you. Megan Giddings is a professor in the Department of English at the, at the University of Minnesota. Her short stories, which have appeared widely in the most prestigious journals, literary journals across the country, have earned Pushcart Prize nominations and other honors. Professor Giddings' first novel, Lakewood, was published by Amistad Press, a division of HarperCollins, in 2020. Lakewood was one of New York Magazine's 10 best books of 2020, one of NPR's best books of 2020, and a Michigan notable book for 2021. Lakewood was also a nominee for two NAACP Image Awards and a finalist for the 2020 LA Times Book Prize in the Ray Bradbury Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Speculative Fiction category. Professor Giddings is the recipient of awarded writing funds, including a Barbara Deming Memorial Grant for feminist fiction. Professor Giddings' writing, which explores themes of gender, sexuality, and coming of age within dystopian universes, has been, to, has been compared to work by the authors Margaret Atwood, Octavia Butler, and Shirley Jackson. In The Women Could Fly, Professor Giddings' second novel, the heroine, Josephine Thomas, called Joe, lives in a world where women must get married by age 30 or else. As in all great science fiction, in The Women Could Fly, elements of our real world intermingle with stranger things like witchcraft, witch hunts, really all things witch. But Professor Giddings also raises the question, are witches really that strange? The Women Could Fly came out just last, last month, so hot off the press, and the accolades are pouring in. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly writes, Giddings pulls off a dynamic story of a black woman's resistance in an oppressive dystopia. Giddings ingeniously blends her harrowing parable of an all powerful patriarchy with insights into racial imbalances. This is brilliant. And to quote from the New York Times book review, it can be tempting to read Giddings's The Women Could Fly which comes in the shadow of the recent Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade and call the book timely. But the relationship at the heart of this novel between Jo and her mercurial mother is much closer to timeless. After Professor Giddings reads an excerpt from her new novel, we'll all have the opportunity to ask questions. The Q&A feature on your screen will be open to everyone. Megan, it's such an honor to feature you at a WPI event. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that beautiful intro, Michelle. It was wonderful. Thank you. So this is my novel, The Woman Could Fly, which I just realized I never asked you if I should call you Dr. Ephraim or Michelle. Whatever you please. Okay. <laughs> but this is the novel she was discussing. And I'm going to read one very short chapter from it and then follow up with a section from another. All of these are from the first half of the book. And what you really need to know going into this, although I feel like I'm just gonna be repeating what Michelle said, is that Joe, the main character's mother disappeared when Joe was 14. And now we're 14 years later and Joe's in the aftermath and trying to decide whether or not to decide her, to declare her mother dead. In this first chapter I'm gonna to read to you, it's based on a story that her mother told her growing up. When I was a child, my mother used to tell me a story she called the witch in the garden of life. Once upon a time, there was a woman a witch loved very much. For her beloved, the witch created a garden. Every tree flourished with fruit, golden berries for knowledge, ruby melons for fulfillment, onyx apples for respite, 
Sapphire persimmons for passion. When the garden was in full bloom, the witch led her beloved out among the soft grasses and through the hedges. Most people will be able to eat only one kind of fruit, the witch said, some two, some none. But the chosen fruit shows their heart's truest desire, choose your life. The witch gestured at the multicolored abundance, her face glowing with the pride of knowing she alone had made all of this. The lover walked around. Each fruit had its own wonderful perfume, but she couldn't choose a single one. Even the bees, the birds, the wind could choose, and the thought made her miserable. When the witch's back was turned, she went back into their cottage, shuttered all the windows, and sat in the dim firelight. It was better when making a decision the woman felt to see only the shape of things. When I heard this story in school, it had a different ending. The witch and the woman weren't lovers, just good, good friends. Choose your life, the witch said in each version. The best friend walked around. She stopped and smelled each fruit and settled on amethyst grapes. They would mean a happy marriage, a house filled with children, a comfortable life. This is how my mother ended the story the last time she told it. After reflecting in the darkness for three days, the lover woke up on the fourth day filled with certainty. She rummaged through the witch's pantry, overturning jars of herbs and black as night cauldrons until she found a small sack of seeds. The woman took them outside, dug at the earth with her nails and fingers until they bled. Her fingernails cracked. She wheezed and sighed and sweated. But when the lover was done, she had planned her own row. There could be grapes, there could be flowers, there could be thorns. It didn't matter. Whatever bloomed was hers. And then I'll skip ahead in the book. Although there are some pretty funny chapters in the mid type. So if you're someone who got this book for class or won it from a raffle, keep going after that chapter. Okay. The last time I saw my mother, it was a Monday, September 28th. A few silver balloons were still bobbing against my bedroom ceiling. It was the year I loved that color. For my birthday, five days before that, she had given me three delicate silver rings and I wore them all on my right hand. My dad had given me a gray sweatshirt with metallic silver sleeves and a necklace with a small robot on it. I felt lucky every time I thought about those gifts because it was clear my parents were paying attention to who I was. For Angie's birthday, her mom had given her a large stuffed rabbit as big as her 14 year old torso. Angie had worn knee high combat boots, a long cardigan and or a biography of Valentina Tershkova or to be allowed to change her name to Valentina. Your parents, they just get you, man, she'd said. My mom wants me to stay nine forever. And I nodded, but I also remembered how much I'd wish when we were younger that my parents would be better at parent stuff. They always forgot to pick me up on time from field trips and after school things. They rarely looked at my homework. When I cried and wanted to go home from sleepovers, my mom would refuse to come get me. She would sigh and remind me life was tough and there were worse things than being at a nice friend's nice house for one night. Angie's mom was always there on time, would drive out even in the middle of a snowstorm to pick her up from somewhere, was front row and playing rapt attention at our basketball games. My mom would read a book, marking the pages lightly with a yellow pencil. That last morning, my mom had made what she called her harvest hashed, reheated leftover roasted vegetables from dinner the night before an egg over easy with crushed red pepper on the yolk, resting precariously on top. She talked to me about a book. It was about a cavern sister in Kentucky where runes were on every surface, even the ceilings. That's actually based on a story one of my undergrads told me. She visited those. And people swore, and this got my attention, this is how I think I remember everything, that they had seen silver bats in these caves. She drove me to school. It was very bright out, but unusually cold felt more like a November day than fresh out of the package autumn. The day was a middle school blur, orange lockers, terrible people who smelled terrible, me, a terrible person who smelled terrible, Romeo and Juliet, French fry scent. In almost all my memories from middle and high school, someone is eating French fries or their grease is in the air's humidity, wheezed out from the drab cafeteria with its permanently stained linoleum. When my mom picked me up from school, it was snowing. Fucking climate change, she muttered while glaring at the glittering flakes. That was at 2.45. I can't remember what she did for the next three hours, but it was general mom at home stuff. She made me unload the dishwasher, threw together dinner, complained about the weather, but not in a way that made me think, oh, she's going somewhere. 
At 6.30 p.m., and I remember because I had to tell this story so many times, mom made us all cocos. She seemed preoccupied and said very little. This is this week's dessert, she says she handed me the cup. Happy cheat day. I went to the kitchen with it, added cinnamon, whipped cream, and marshmallows. When I went back down to the living room, she raised an eyebrow at my mug. We were on strict diets. She called it our staying alive in case of an apocalypse diet, but the fun name didn't make me feel better about it. Angie's mom told her all the time it was better to love her body as it was, to not overthink what she ate. I thought how her mother would never say anything like that to me. She always wanted me the best possible version of myself. Even at 14, I wondered how she could know what that was. In the grand scheme of being a person, I, I had barely started. We watched the snow in silence. I hated it, worried it would stay until the following March. Then I read a book for school, watched TV. I assumed at the time my mom was simmering over my cocoa additions, that she wanted to say something, but my dad had asked her to cool it with the diet talk. He so rarely asked her for anything that when he did, she took it seriously. She was also bidding on something private on eBay. I assumed it was either a late gift for me or one for my dad's birthday in November. She kept la looking at her laptop screen and muttering to herself. It sounded like she was saying, I'm watching myself get robbed. We would find out later that she'd been bidding on a set of decorative cushions. They were hideous. Mustard and pea green paisley. The back, a scarlet and cream spiral pattern. When we opened the package after her disappearance, my dad was sure they had sent the wrong thing. I was disappointed. When the package first arrived, I thought it might be her head like in a movie. Then for months, those awful cushions sat in my bedroom. At one point, I tore one apart. Maybe a letter was inside. Nothing. In my notebook, I wrote to myself, cushions equals question mark, question mark. And now we say things like those cushions were a cry for help. Or maybe the bigger mystery is how she could have thought they were these were worth buying. The remaining two cushions are still in my dad's basement. My mom went to bed early, hugged me goodnight. She smelled like almond oil and grass and something else. I thought maybe she was getting sick and that was why she smelled a little sour. In the morning, she and the snow were gone. The car was still there. Her hiking boots and coat had left with her. It was September 29th and everything was different. The last thing she said to me, standing in the doorway of my room, as I bent over my desk, barely turning to look at her, was, don't stay up too late, okay? And I'll end there. What a thrill to hear these words in your own voice, Megan. I love how you capture adolescence. It brings me back to that. Uh, Kate and I will get things started with some initial questions, but we're eager to have our audience chime in. Please post your questions at any time and we'll read them aloud for Professor Giddings to answer. All right, Megan, I'm going to start us off. Um, in his essay, Black to the Future, written in 2000, writer Walter Mosley makes the statement that speculative fiction offers a space for people who are dissatisfied with the way things are and can be a way for those who have been made to feel powerless to imagine a better world. This aspect of science fiction, he argues, may explain the appeal that the genre has for Black readers and writers. Does any of this resonate for you? All of this resonates for me. I think it's really interesting too, because when I, and you and I were talking before about how I usually teach undergraduate career writing, and I feel like it also resonates to what I'm seeing in the classroom too, where a lot of my students are writing fantasy or science fiction. And I think it shows a growing sense of how often either we're dissatisfied or because of the pandemic, a lot of us wanted to flee the real world. And because again, what a dissatisfying time for everybody. <laughs> but for me, I, it speaks to me because as a fiction writer, I, I've always been really interested in talking a little sideways about things and how a speculative world or a fantasy world or a science fiction world, the, all of those give me the space so that when I'm upset about something or frustrated, like a lot of the women could fly, I, I began it in 2018 a time where I don't think I've ever been more dissatisfied or 
angry about how how women are treated in this country, how in general it, it's just baked into our culture at this point. And then we we try to make it different, and it's not. And so a lot of this book, I think, does come from that like seed of dissatisfaction. And then the speculative elements like witches or wondering about being cursed, it it gave me the space to play and have fun. So it wasn't just didactic or here's a speech that you have to read for 300 pages. We can be mad and have fun. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. Um, Megan and I did not practice this, but this really, what you just said, really links so well with our next question, which is this. Um, the New York Times review of The Women Could Fly makes a distinction between timely and timeless. This made me think about your inspiration for the novel. Readers are certainly meant to recognize our world and the one you've created in your novel, women's rights, the rights of anyone who is not cisgender and em embracing the conservative heterosexual institution of marriage is under siege, or at the very least, they are targeted and interrogated. Um, are your stories driven by political or literary inspiration, or actually, which comes first? Ooh, no one's asked me this question before. I, I want to say, at heart, it comes from literary inspiration because a lot of my process, it, it does come, it comes from play at first where I sometimes give myself generative exercises to do and that builds into something. I write down my dreams a lot, which is in the great tradition of literary writers who we love writing down dreams or I, I do different, just any way I can think of to trick myself into writing. I do that. And then usually the more political, in, and in the past, I used to kind of hesitate about that word because I was like, well, that's unfair. It, it felt for a long time, like the only people whose work that was being called political were writers of color. Mm. And it, I can't remember who said this, but someone a few years ago wrote an article about how no matter what you write or how you live your life, because of the ways that people view the world, no matter what you're writing, it's political. It in some ways reflects the ways that you see the world and your deep interest in it. And that's at least the way we live now, that's political. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems no matter what, that's always gonna bubble up in my writing, even if I want it to or not. Right, right. Did you, you know, going back to that New York Times book review, I was very fascinated by that timely versus timeless. So what's the difference between timely and timeless? And did you, did you like that point that that reviewer made um, to really sort of steer it away, the novel away from it being timely in the political moment with Roe v. Wade or anything else that's going on and to, to identify it as more of a timeless novel? I mean, part of me wanted to quibble because I thought they could make the argument a little better. <laughs> And that's just like the natural professor in me. It's obnoxious. Um, but it, I think it captured something really well that happened after the review, where for some of the galleys, and, and a galley, if, for those of you who are students might not have encountered them, they're the review copies that get sent to people. If you follow people on Bookstagram and they don't have a hardcover of a book, it's usually a galley. And those aren't the finished versions. Like there's there's over 600 differences between the galley that people had for my book, for example, versus the hardcover. But I, I had written a letter and the letter, I had talked about the convent heat, the com, I can never say the name right the first time, but they were a collective, a black woman's collective in the seventies who they wrote this incredible pamphlet that was just arguing to be considered lovely human and when I had read it while researching for the book, it had been kind of devastating to me to think that we've been asking for these same rights or ideas since 19, I think it was published in 1974. 
And my younger brother, who's a triple ADS, and that's African-American, African diaspora studies. He's a PhD student in the field at the moment. He, he showed me just a week and a half ago a letter that was almost similar to that institute to that collective's letter from the 1920s and it was again just this desire and it's still wrapped up in how black women are treated and it's intersectional and interesting but the things that we often call timely the more you pay attention to especially the history of this country i i don't feel qualified to talk for it, about any other country it seems like every 50 years we keep having the same arguments. We take some steps forward and then we get immersed in the argument again for years and years. And then we get a little farther forward, which it, that sounds really cynical, but sometimes it's freeing to know that we're still even, even when we're fighting, we're still trying. We're still trying to make the world a place for how the people in it are living at this time. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. It makes me think that the word timely is maybe misleading or maybe even inaccurate <laughs> actually um, in that context. So thank you. You know, I, I was thinking of, you know, when I, when I finished reading the novel, um, so just talking about, made me think about what you're just saying, that is this, is my takeaway from the novel, it felt fear or you know, maybe even just this, that sort of that feeling of cynicism of like, oh, these things have always been happening and they keep happening again and they're gonna happen in the future. But there was also hope. You know, as, as a writer, how do you strike a balance or negotiate between the two when you think about what you want readers to feel when they finish the novel? I, I think it's really necessary. Actually, let me go even further back. Let me, let me be pretty blunt. So for my first novel, it, it was a really big struggle between me and my editor and everybody to think about how we want to finish this novel, where there was a, there was a real argument between having an explicitly tragic ending, between having a really ridiculous ending. I'm being real, kind of vague here because I still want to sell some copies of Lakeland. So <laughs> if you all haven't read it, you this is like the commentary track you can have in your head when you're finishing the book but it, it was an argument because that book is so deeply mixed between issues of class race gender and also medicine and also the rights of people who might know things about the U.S. government that the U.S. government doesn't want them to know so there was a lot of arguments about that. And for The Women Could Fly, I, I only want, wrote one version of the ending. And I knew that for this book, it, it was necessary to leave with optimism. And I'll admit that I, I rarely think about Margaret Atwood. That sounds like a real burn. I rarely think about her. Um, but one of the things that's always sit poorly with me about The Handmaid's Tale and I'm going to spoil this because that book has been out since 1986. And most of the people Fair attending, you th that book is older than you are. Um, but it there's all these devastating things. And the main character gets let off into a van. You don't know if she's going to freedom. You don't know if she's about to be murdered. And then it jumps ahead. We're 100 years in the future. A university press professor is giving a talk about the text that you just read. Everybody claps at the end. And it, the endings never sat well with me because it you just jump ahead. You, there's no sense of what you can do or how you can come together. It kind of just gives you the sense that, well, time moves forward and we'll be fine as long as time keeps moving forward. And I really wanted to write, because I knew this text, no matter what, was going to get compared to The Handmaid's Tale. If you write a feminist text about oppression in any way, it's going to get compared to The Handmaid's Tale. But I wanted to leave readers with a sense of, we should want more. We should be together. We should be optimistic. We should work for it. 
in I, there were no arguments about that. It was how everyone, once they read the ending, they were like, no, this is, this is right for this book. Our chat is, um, our Q&A is starting to light up with questions. First of all, a compliment, not a question, just a comment. Lakewood is an amazing book, a must read. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. And I also, um, there's a question that has to do with witches. That is something um, that Michelle and I have been thinking about and have a question crafted. Um, so I want to move in that direction. Um, I noticed in the acknowledgements for the woman, women could fly, you mentioned that you told your agent you wanted to write about witches and he replied, if anyone can make them feel new, it's you. Um, so I mean, that's just Dan though. That's how he talks to me. He has <laughs> to talk great. to me though. It's great. I, I, I loved that. Um, what got you interested in witchcraft and kept you interested over the course of the project? Um, how did you handle research for this project? So, I, okay, there are multiple things. First, I'll do the intellectual reason. I think witches are a ripe metaphor, but also something, again, that you can play with in your fiction, because there's a joy there if you want to make magic, if you want the world to be a different place. It's an easy access. It's a trope we know. And also, it's always can tell you something about power, where witches, they've always, and they tell you like a different route to power than the usual route. It's since, instead of being within the social norms, you, you gain that power through learning and education. Often you're teaching, you're observing, you sometimes have to work together. And that really is in defiance of the usual ways that people accumulate power. You're, you're not just like the king's or the lord's son and then his best friend and then his best friend, which is usually kind of the juxtaposition folk tales you've gained your power by going out into nature and learning. The not intellectual reason is I, I grew up reading Harry Potter and those books are dead to me because of the way their author has acted over many years now. And I also wanted to find a book that would kind of give me that same feeling as an adult and none of the witch books I was reading was really pleasing me although I recently heard that Babel might hit that um like scratch that itch a little bit it just came out last month too mm. um but I wanted to write a book that for those of us who long to be in worlds where witch witches are real where magic is real but also want to think deeply about our own world. I wanted to put those things together. And then you also asked me about research too. So for the research process, and there, there are two parts of it. One is research on witches and witchcraft. So I did everything from buying very weird little spell books and reading them, reading folklore, reading a history of magic, reading about the Salem witch trials, trying to do some of the spells, just to be in that space. Nothing, nothing that cool happened, but it was fun. Um, I have a lot of beautiful candles now, but they are not magic. And also I did a lot of research too on black collective thinking. And I thought a lot about how often, all the way back from reconstruction, Black social groups have come together to try to make their communities better. And it's almost always been hinged around education our children, where one of the ways that we have public education is through those Black schoolhouses and making them available in the South. And it's really interesting and fascinating to me that every time this happens, or like with the Black Panther Party, it was about pre-K education on many levels or feeding and making sure that everybody, especially the children, had food. And how often a sense of we need each other, we need to work with one another. And especially if you're 
a group that is homogeneously black. And there are other groups where there are, were many Asian American groups on the West Coast. There are a lot of native groups who also were doing this community aid through many, many years. And they were always reacted with like deep resistance from their communities or again, the federal government. And I wanted to think really deeply about what it's like to feel a sense of freedom while also getting that freedom from knowing that you belong to your community, that other people are important and you're not more important than them. And thinking really deeply about the ways that I could integrate maybe a sense of that into this novel. I think that comes through, you know, in, in my reading of the novel, really uh, strongly and beautifully, um, those island scenes in particular. Um, we have a question that I think sort of dovetails. This is from the chat. Um, this is from my student, Regina, um, who is wondering how you balance issues of different marginalized groups, but also have a story that's still relatable to audiences that are not part of those marginalized groups. How do your experiences as a Black woman play into your writing? Thanks for the question, Regina. And those are two very complicated questions. So the first question, it sounds kind of like you're a writer and thinking about how to write these things. And usually one of the like beauty like the beauties of writing is that when you start off, it can sometimes feel like you have to do everything abstract so that you can appeal to many different people. And one of the most freeing things that you can think of as a writer, and hopefully you're a writer, Regina, and I'm not just wildly training you like one, is that attention, attention equals love to most people. When you pay deep attention to things, or when you're writing also pays deep attention to things. So you get into specificity. You, you treat people like you're giving them kind of a guided tour, but it's still fun and interesting because the wrong guided tour with too many details and too many things, again, becomes a little boring and overwhelming. But especially if you can feel like you're giving someone a deeply attentive guided tour of a person, even if it's not like them, even if this person is from a hundred years ago or from a place that could never exist, usually that speaks to readers because it's one of the natural ways that we feel sometimes when we have a crush, we're paying such deep attention to someone else that we notice all those things. They become a person to us through that deep, like looking, that deep noticing. And that's what fiction, when done well, especially on characters, it, it kind of mirrors that type of gaze. And then my experiences of, as a Black woman have really informed my writing. I, in, in terms of talking about systemic issues, there are times where things are a little emotionally close to things I've experienced. I don't think I've written anything wholesale of what I've actually experienced into a novel because I already lived it. I'm not a nonfiction writer, but sometimes I look at the kernel of an experience and it's one that I can't stop thinking about. And I try to think of, okay, how can I write through this in fiction? How can I emotionally process this or get somewhere where I can think about this experience, but it doesn't hurt me anymore. And also that's kind of the tragic version, but there's also like the joyful version. I mean, all the pleasures of being a person are also hopefully in my fiction. And that's one of the other beautiful things about being a fiction writer or a poet or a nonfiction writer is sometimes you're writing a love letter just to being alive. The things that you appreciate and enjoy, you get to put them again in fiction so other people can appreciate and enjoy them. Very beautifully put. Makes me think about also, I think you mentioned earlier that one of the ideas from the excerpt that you read, one of the excerpts came from a student um, in terms of a place that they had visited. So it's almost, you know, the theme of community is in writing uh, the way you described it as well. Yeah, she told a horrifying story about going to those caves on a date. And 
getting so scared while her date was like, this is the best time. And she was like terrified of like being that far underground and seeing the runes. And I, I will always remember her telling that story. <laughs> That's great. Um, Kate, I don't know if you want to take another question from the chat. Uh, sure, I can actually, we have a couple of questions that I think are related to each other. Um, they have to do with influence. Um, one is specifically, um, has Octavia Butler influenced your work or writing? And then there's another question that's a little broader, um, asking more interpersonally, is there someone who's inspired your writing, a fa family member, friend, or a fellow writer? I love these questions. So yeah, Octavia Butler has influenced me where it, I think Blood Child is one of the best short stories ever written. It's, it's given me so much to consider as a writer over and over again. And I also remember the first time reading it and not understanding it at all. It, and then the older I get, the more complicated and nuanced it becomes. Like, it's one of the pleasures of being a reader, especially if you're a reader who allows themselves to say, I don't understand this, but maybe I'll be different. You get to keep coming back to the books and seeing how you've changed. It also makes you feel smarter sometimes if you ever need an ego boost. Um, and then in terms of well, one other thing that Octavia Butler has done is I think a lot about her, she wrote this essay on positive obsession. And I think a lot now, especially when I'm teaching, I, I like to ask my students, especially when I'm getting to know them, what are you obsessed with? Hmm. And sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's big, but usually these obsessions, it makes you a writer. And one of the hardest things that I think it is for people sometimes is that they think writers, we always have to be original. We can't talk about the same things. We can't, we, we always have to be innovating. But the longer you're a writer, the more you realize, no, that's not true. Sometimes my obsessions are long and beautiful. They keep me writing and they don't always have to be deep. I, one of my friends who's a fellow writer, her, her obsession is The Bachelor. <laughs> and, but when it, it's both funny and fun, but she also thinks a lot about what they tell us about the people who like watching The Bachelor because it is fun to watch. There's like a set system, it, it's ridiculous. You, you know who's gonna win most of the time. But also what it says about love and how people want to talk or have access to it. So sometimes it's finding that thing that you might think is ridiculous and couldn't be like the essence of a writing career, the bachelor, tennis, soccer. And then trying to think, well, what is it about this that speaks to me? What is it about this that it helps me understand about the greater world? Like, if I wanted to write really deeply about soccer, I could say, I, I watch a lot of Premier League. I, I could say like, some of it is about the idea that 11 people have to do this job together. It's again, community. And there's something really deeply beautiful to me about watching 11 people, some of who can't even speak to each other well because they're from all over the world. And their only language is soccer they know how to play and they know how their bodies move. And that's enough. And it tells me a lot sometimes about what I wanna write or say in fiction from there. Kate, what was the other part of the question? Um, so it was uh, thinking a little more um, interpersonally if there were people in your life who um, inspired your writing a family member, friend, or fellow writer? I, I really like the fellow writer thing because so often writer, there's this idea, especially, I, 
can't even say when it's getting started because I've met some awful established writers who everybody's competition, but most of the time when you can make actual friends who are writers who, yeah, there's like that hint of competition if it's done well, where you want to impress them. You want to, you want them to actually think you're good at it. But you also are mature enough or understand the field enough to know that this person isn't taking anything from you. There's nothing that you can do or control that would make it so that their book gets published, it means yours doesn't. Or if they get up for an award, well, you can't control like the award board. You don't know any of these things. So it, it gives you both the feel of someone who cares a lot about your writing and understands it in the industry. And also you want to impress them and that's how you should make writer friends a little bit. You find the people that you want to impress a little bit or have deeply interesting things to say about books or reading, but you still want to impress them because they probably know more about books or reading than you do in some way. And you build this complicated, beautiful relationship with it. And then you keep doing that over and over again, because what you need is a community. You need people to read with you and think with you. You nurture it together. So I have a question about a theme that really emerged for me and I'm sure many yeah. of the readers uh, reading The Women Could Fly. It's a story about art. Uh, it felt to me like a story about art. We've got Joe's essays, her mother's storytelling, the art she creates as an adult, her professional work curating art at a museum. And it was almost a, for me as a reader, an urgency or centrality, at least about this theme. And it made me think, are you writing about art now from a place of reflection? You're older and wiser than you, know, you used to be um, mm -hmm. as a writer. And so, in this novel, are you making a statement about the role of art in our lives? No one's asked me this question either, even though I've been kind of dying to talk about the art in the book. I, I mean, I think art is necessary. And I, okay. So lately I've been trying to, I've been listening to podcasts. I've been looking at many definitions of how people define what, what it means to be a person. And it's usually in oppositions where animals do this, we do this, or we can do this, but they can't do this. And one of the things that I've noticed that people keep returning to is the human pleasure of making things. Mm. We love making things. And this is anything from what might not feel like making things to some of us, like taking a picture for Insta, but that still we're making something. We're still producing. We, our brains love it. We love art. We love, I mean, some people are like, I hate art. Well, then stop putting your pictures on Instagram because that's also art. Um, but even, even children, they, they love making. It's one of the natural things that sustains us through our lives. We make our houses beautiful. We make, I mean, even the language we use for friendships is we're making friends with somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's that level of building. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that when I, I, I was really depressed writing a lot of this book and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that this was a book where I really wanted to write about the beautiful things of being alive or what it's, or reassure myself of like what it means to be a person. And I think that's what art does for me. It reassures me that being a human is good. I mean, nothing is easily good in this world, but in terms of what to aspire to, what keeps me here, it's making things, it's art, it's, it's making friends. Mm -hmm. It's all of those makings. Really so cool. speaking of um, making things and writerly craft more generally, um, several of our creative writing classes this term read your short story, The Disappointing Earth. 
Um, mm -hmm. And for folks who haven't read it in that story, the main character, um, who is a teenager named Ambrosia, um, she lives in a world that is much like ours, except that people regularly get abducted by aliens. Mm -hmm. And to be selected for abduction is very cool. And like every teenager, Ambrosia desperately wants to be cool. Um, it can be really tricky, I think. Um, our, our students really um, love speculative fiction. You know, it's it's yeah. something they read for pleasure, um, fantasy, sci-fi. Um, I, I think it can be tricky, though, to write speculative in short forms, mm -hmm. maybe due to the world building aspects. So I was curious, do you have any advice for writers about how to write a fully imagined world that feels really rich, that feels complete, that's different from ours in just a few pages, the length of a short story versus more of a novel length project? I love this question, Kate. And on a brief side note, I always laugh when people teach this story, but because like one of the few times I've visited somewhere to talk specifically about this story, um, during that visit, a student did like a five to 10 minute just throw down with me about how it was a story about losing your virginity. And it blew my mind. That was never <laughs> on my mind. But I think about this every time. <laughs> now, when I when someone's like, we we talked a lot about this story, I always wonder if there's one person in the classroom who was thinking it the whole time, but did not want to say it out loud like that kid clearly was. It was he was well, the Q and A is open, everyone. If anybody, yeah, yeah. has any comments. <laughs> um. So. One of the world building advices, I actually go back to um, Ursula Le Guin. And I, I do this exercise with my classes to get them started because I like to think a lot about speculative with them. Is that one of the things that Ursula Le Guin, and it's in Steering the Craft, she talks about if you can build an object for the world that you're making that is clearly has something to do with the environment or how people live that's how you know that you have a whole functioning world sometimes. It's an object and it's something that you've invented, but it shows like the necessities or how the people in this world have innovated to stay alive. I'm saying that much more succinctly than she did. And she said much more beautifully and engagingly than I just did. And I, I think a lot about things like that, what objects tell us about the way people live. I think, a lot too when I'm trying to build world, worlds for short stories of trends like that. Like so often, and especially when you're writing about younger characters, although I I feel like, I think adults think that they're far more immune to trends than they actually are. But trends also tell you about the ways people live, about how people wanna be perceived even about where they put themselves in the social structure sometimes. Like I, I go out now and no, and no offense, Gen Z, but I can tell which ones of you are trying to be cool because you've got, there, there's like a specific like makeup, hair look, black leggings, which it, it is cool, but it still tells you how much someone's putting in the effort and it tells you about the world around them. And like that, that look talks, tells me that someone takes a lot of pictures for Instagram, for example, or is on TikTok a lot. And then you can start thinking about things from there, where if you build a trend like that, well, you can think about, well, what, what is your universe's version of how people even learn about trends? What is your, what do those trends say about the ways people live or want to be perceived or how they anticipate their life being lived? And when you can start like building those questions for yourself and then answering them, that's one way to know, I have a whole world here. I can find the questions to ask about it and then I can actually answer them while writing the story. That's such wonderful specific advice. Think of objects, think of trends. Yeah, um, we have um, another question in the Q&A. Um, which is asking more generally, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to express themselves or their views in writing, but is just not sure how to start? How do you start writing? 
So this is taking it all the way back to dreams, but I usually tell people to write their dreams down. And it's because it's this simultaneously thing. You're writing down something that happened to you, but it also didn't happen to you. It's something your brain made. And also you get first the pleasure of writing. It might be absurd. A lot of people's dreams always have a hint of absurdity, even if it's, I was just sitting in a classroom and then a dog walked in and said, why are you in class? And then the dream's over. And so then you write that down and then it gets you also in the space where you can ask yourself, well, what does this mean? And I, I firmly don't believe that every dream you have means something or some kind of wish or something like that, but it gets you in a space where you're already thinking about how your brain is expressing itself. It shows also like your relationship to images when you start doing this work. And one other thing that I think can be really helpful sometimes is you, you walk around with a cell phone that has a notes app all the time. And anytime you see something when you're alone, if you take the bus, if you walk, if you have the space to do it, just sit down and just write what you noticed. Because again, the things that you notice or suddenly seem important to you, it can either tell you something about yourself or it can give you inspiration. Because usually when you're deeply noticing something, it, it means you have a question about it. You have some sort of big feeling. And that can lead you to finding the thing to write. You had mentioned, I think it was just near the beginning um, of our talk that you really love doing generative writing exercises yourself. Are there any um, in particular that you return to over and over or that you might recommend to um, newer writers? I try not to return because I always have to keep myself entertained. So I, but so one of my favorite generative writing exercises to do with people is that you have two characters and you first write a scenario between them and the third person. I, and I usually say like date or job interview. And then the third person, you want to make it go as terrible as possible. You want to make it a mess. Be as dramatic and wild as you want to be. And then you return to it in the first person and you write about it from the perspective of a character telling someone else about it and trying to make themselves look good while telling the story. And sometimes just those two things together are enough to be a whole story. Great. Sometimes those things are enough to help you build the character out from the second half. And then sometimes the whole story may just be the first half and then you revise it knowing more about one of the characters after having done the exercise. It's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We will have to try that um, both in our classes and I'm sure folks will want to try it outside of them as well. Well, I like the focus also on the self, you know, and mm -hmm. getting to, getting to how, how your brain uh, expresses itself. I like how you put that uh, as opposed to being so outward focused on looking at other writers and, you know, what, what do they do? What do they do? But just sort of really getting to know oneself as a writer, getting to know one's brain. I love that idea. Yeah, I, I like to really emphasize it because I don't think that there's anything wrong with how much creative writing pedagogy it, it focuses on other writers. But I think especially when you're getting started, it, it can be really helpful because so often like the questions I get when I do visits like this, or I don't feel like I have any original ideas. Mm -hmm. And my answer is always like, no one does. It's really hard to have an original idea. The original thing is you, no one is like you. And I don't mean that in a, you're like the special chosen one, but in terms of your point of view, the things you like or love or hate, the more of your personality that gets in the fiction, the less likely you have to worry about being original. Your, yourself adds like that extra flavor that will make people keep coming back. Even if you're just like writing about a couple breaking up and getting back together, if you tell it in, a funny way or a sad way or 
a mixture of both, but it's your voice. Most people will keep coming back. We both like being with someone who can actually sound like themselves. And we also like thinking about something we understand, relationships. I'm thinking as well about the way this relates to what you mentioned earlier about obsessions. A great joy for me is always reading people writing about what they're obsessed about. I think that always uh, yields just such wonderful prose, um, even if I know nothing about that obsession. Um, It's just, it's so fun. It's so fun um, to get to share it for a little while over the course of a few pages. Yeah, I I think it's so underrated what it's like to be in the company of someone who actively loves things. I I made the mistake for a long time of dating people who I thought were cool because they hated everything or had very specific points of view. And the joy of spending time with people who actually aren't ashamed of liking things and just want you to experience joy or pleasure with them just from like going out to dinner and trying to find like the best thing or not being embarrassed that they want to sing along with the radio it's it's living do we have time for one more question kate Yes, let's see. Um, So we have another one in the chat um, that is about um, somebody really admired in um, The Disappointing Earth and in the excerpt that you read, um, the way that you wrote about really complicated family dynamics and feeling alone. Um, And this person is curious about um, relationships, um, maybe your own relationships, how they uh, influence your writing. You know, are you inspired by um, dynamics that you see in your own relationships that then get fictionalized and put on the page? Yeah, I'm, I'm very influenced by it. And sometimes I think a lot about how I might be relitigating moments. It's usually never the main character, but inside characters where things that I'm kind of touching on. And I, and I think it's really interesting because I don't, I'm, I'm married and I don't really see anything from my marriage coming out. But at the same time, I also think a lot about how I probably wouldn't be able to be the writer I am without like having the spouse I have where like he thinks I'm the best writer in the world. Like he, he goes out of his way to like read my books. I mean, and that, that sounds like the lowest bar, but in terms of the number of people I know who didn't keep writing because they got with the wrong person who didn't really believe in them as a writer or didn't want to let them make space in their relationship or life to do those things. It's like another glass ceiling that I don't think people talk about a lot. Like there's the systemic, but there's also the personal. You have to be with someone if you want to be a writer who actually gets that and wants you to do it and wants you to be happy in that field. Right. And that's a theme that really comes out in this novel, Megan. Um, Time is flying. Um, Speaking of flying. And we're going to wrap things up, but before we do, before we say our official thank you and goodbyes, it's my pleasure to welcome Jean King, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at WPI. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Megan. That was wonderful. I'm glued to the story, your authentic, beautiful voice. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And I have to thank my two professors from sharing your book with me because I finally, I'm like, okay, I'm on chapter two, but I swear I'm going to (laughs) finish because it already gripped me and I hope I could fly by the end of it. Um, I love the idea of magic. I love the idea of how you combine your journey with what you're talking about. I already love your husband. (laughs) So it's a lot of love and joy here. Thank you so much for spending time with us. This is our arts and science week here at WPI. We're STEM school and people think about us in engineering fields. And when we hear what our faculty in the humanities and arts bring to us, 
the joy is is so much for me. Thank you so much for joining us and coming this week. I wish we wish you had we had you in person, but we'll Next we'll time. take this. And one of these days when you're in the neighborhood, please drop in and and say hi. We'd love to have you. Thank you for having me. I I've had a great time truly talking to all of you. And I'll definitely visit. Yes, come visit. All right, so I'll turn it over to Professors Ephraim and McIntyre to finish up. All right, thank you, Dean King, and everyone who came to attend this event. And many, many thanks to author Megan Giddings for spending this time with us today. We loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.